interesting teaching video for you guys who are at home. I hope everybody's doing well. I know, once again, crazy times, but I hope that those people who have chimed into the first two videos have gotten a little bit something out of it, uh, you know, spurred their interest a little bit, gotten you guys curious and, and hoping to learn more. So once again, all these videos that we're doing is just a small little glimpse into the whole idea of investing in real estate and we're just scraping the surface. That's all we're doing here. So uh, if you guys have any more questions, you guys want to delve into it a little bit deeper, please feel free to reach out to us at any time. We're super happy to help. This is what we do. Okay. So today's lesson is actually a really awesome one. Um, the burr. The burr is actually probably my favorite strategy when it comes to real estate investing. Uh, and I'm going to illustrate why that is. And we've done a ton of burrs through through uh, through our career in this in this uh, investing game, and uh, and we've just seen it be very profitable. A lot of our joint venture partners, we are implementing the strategy to get them great returns as well as us. So it has been remarkable in what's being done. So going through the five things that we're going to be going through. Once again, I'm going to touch on it fairly quickly. If I skip over or, or go over something, once again, let me know. We're here to help, right? So ask a question and I'll be sure to reach out to you guys and make sure to answer it properly. Okay. So first of all, what is a burr? Then we're going to talk about having your catering it too, which is really why this is one of the best strategies in my opinion. Three, redeploy cash quickly. Four, we're going to go through a live example, one that we've recently finished. And five, typical properties that you would see being burred out. And now this could apply for anything, but what we're seeing a lot of common, you know, the influx of people who are doing this uh, uh, frequently, right? So first and foremost, what is a burr? The burr is effectively an acronym for buy, renovate, rent out, refinance, and then repeat. So all you're doing with a property so you know how in the video one, we went through the typical buy and hold process. All we're doing here was we're adding a few steps. So we're buying it and then renovating and refinancing it. Okay. So those are the two ones that, that we, you know, typically didn't cover in the first one, but in a burst strategy, that's where your, your, your big returns come from because out of the three main returns, the cash on cash return, the mortgage pay down return and the appreciation return. The only differences between this is that you're actually accounting for a force of appreciation return as well, which is a massive number. So I'll show you guys what that looks like in actual figures. Okay. So effectively that's a, a burr. You buy a property, you're going to do some renovations to it, whether you're adding additional units or just making an existing multifamily nicer or single family for that matter. You can burr single families too. Then you're going to get some tenants. You're going to rent it out, put those tenants in. Then you're going to go to the bank. You're going to apply for an appraisal. The bank's going to send out an appraiser. And now that property, since it's being renovated, is now worth more money. Then you're going to refinance that, pull the cash back out of the property, and then you repeat the process. It's a beautiful thing. Beautiful thing. Any which way. So having your cake and eating it too. Why I put that as a point on this is because the beauty of the burr is that you don't have to sell your property to make an instant profit. And by instant, I mean like real estate investing instant, which could be like a couple months down the road, right? But when you buy the property, often when you flip it, you have to sell the asset, right? Then you don't own it anymore, it's someone else's. Or when you buy and you rent out a property, then sometimes you have to leave a lot of money parked in that deal and you can't access the capital. But on the buy, renovate, refinance, you can literally have your cake and eat it too. You can buy the property, renovate it, pull the cash back out and you keep it. So you can, like we've done burrs where we pulled out a surplus. So sometimes we've gotten paid 20, 30, $40,000 to own a brand new duplex that's being recently renovated. It's wild. So just something to, to take note of. It's, it's pretty, pretty impactful and pretty powerful stuff when you really run the figures. Um, redeploying the cash quickly. This is a great point because at the end, if you look at the last R, it's called repeat. If you can do this consistently and you can do find a property, that's a great burr. And theoretically, you can pull 95% of your capital back out. You can take that capital and now redeploy it into another deal right away. 
no no questions about it so it's actually really great in that capacity where you don't have to keep money parked in that one singular deal because when you consider one property have a certain return you're paying down the debt you're making cash flow the property is appreciating how much more impactful is if you have two of them or three or four or five whatever the case may be that's where you start to make some massive returns and that's where you can ride the wave up and start to really cash flow you can then offset your actual income that you're making from your jobs right the next part is i want to go through an actual example that we've done okay so i'm going to be running through this very very quickly i brought my notebook because i'm actually going to give you the true figures of what we went through okay and as I'm going through it, I'll talk a little bit about the process as well. But if, once again, if I skip over something or if I go too fast, or if, if you guys need some clarity on something, please type a message, send me a private message, whatever it may be. We're here to answer some questions and, and uh, make a little bit more clear as to how this happens. So we bought a property in downtown Hamilton. It's two and a half story property. And uh, we bought it actually at $340,000. So the purchase price. We thought, and the, the interesting part about this, I'm going to start this way, working my way down as to like what we purchased it at, the construction and all that kind of stuff. But you'll notice that in the burr, once I've got this all down here on paper, the way to actually analyze a burr is more likely starting from here and working your way up. And you understand what I mean, because the end game goal and why the strategy is a little bit more complex, a lot of moving parts, is because you're effectively flipping the property to yourself but you have to make sure that the property can carry itself once the deal is all said and done. You don't want to be stuck with a property. You've now renovated all to the nines. It looks beautiful. You have tenants in there. And then every single month you're out of pocket like 500 bucks. It's crazy. You'll go broke, right? So you want to make sure that you're, you're checking all the boxes. So we're going to go from the top down. But just know when you're analyzing a burr, often it's best to start this way, work your way up, right? Well, either which way. Start just make sure you look into it, right? Okay, so bought this property for $340,000. Now, construction costs on this project were massive. So $250,000, and this is converting uh, this into three residential units. And I'm talking brand new, new wiring, new uh, electrical, adding two additional meters to it, all new insulation we pretty much have to reframe the whole house all the sub joists were cut out and hacked apart by the previous owner so there was a big rehab job done here adding three kitchens you know making sure everything is is jiving on the plumbing side of things right so big big project um that amounted to about two hundred fifty thousand dollars i'm keeping the numbers round to make it simple but we're just about there regardless now our holding costs and our debt servicing amounted to about twenty thousand dollars total Okay, so we think about this whole property. Now, $340,000, this was actually the original purchase. So we actually only put 20% of the money down and the bank held the other 80%, right? That's how we would do it typically anyway. And the bank loaned us the money on it. So it was great. Well, they actually loaned our partners the money on it. And that's how this, this whole thing played out. So this 20%, that's, that's okay. Whether it's 20 or 80, we're gonna keep this whole $340,000 figure on the board because realistically it doesn't matter what happens we still owe that money to the bank whether it's now or when we refinance so just for calculation purposes let's keep the whole figure in here okay so all in total in this project right now you got to consider we're six hundred and ten thousand dollars in on the deal looks to be a big number Right? And it's a lot of initial capital investment. That's one thing to consider. But don't fear because as much as it's a big capital investment on the front end, our goal is to pull it right back out underneath, capture all that money for ourselves, and then be left with as little as possible. Okay? So the um, so realistically for our standpoint, we had the two hundred and fifty thousand plus the twenty, so two hundred and seventy thousand dollars plus the twenty percent of the three forty that was out of our partner's pocket, right? That was what they're effectively owed back when we go to refinance the property. So when we finished this whole project, we were anticipating a $700,000 after repair value. So our anticipated ARV was equal to 700K. When we got our appraisal done after it was all said and done, it actually came back at 715,000. So I'll put actual. 
right? So at $715,000, this is where the real interesting part happens of the entire Burr strategy. We go, hi, Mr. and Mrs. Bank, we would now like to borrow against our asset that we deem to be considerably more valuable than what we originally purchased to that. The bank says, okay, well, we're gonna send out an appraiser. Right? So they send out an appraiser, the appraiser walks through and sees that, oh, new windows, oh, it's now multifunctional, it has a number of different units in it, that's very, very good. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this new value that you have, and we're going to lend you 80% loan to value. Now remember, in, in commercial world, it might not be 80%, typically with residential refinancing, you can refinance up to 80%, usually no more, right? But right now, standard 80% refi is pretty common. So if we consider that at 80%, the bank's literally going to give that money back to us. That means that they're going to give us $572,000 back. All right? Now, if we look at what we totally spent on the deal, now that doesn't matter that we've only put 20% down on the 340, right? Remember what I was saying before? It doesn't matter. We still owe the 80% even though we're borrowing it. But if we look at the 572 amount that the bank's now going to give us, and now we still have equity, the difference between the 750 and the 572, that's all equity growth that we now get to keep. It's phantom income. We can only really tap into it if we sell the property. But we're working off of the refinance amount that we can get at 80%. So if we look at the difference between what we have currently in the property, which is the $610,000, this is what we owe to make sure we can get back out of the deal so that we're square. No more money in the deal. The bank's willing to get us 572, which means that we still in the deal have $30,000, right? So you might say, okay, well, $30,000, what when do I get that money back? Well, we'll talk about that, but our goal typically is to get this money back out as soon as possible. So let's say we hold that $38,000 in the property and one year from now, the, the mortgage 572 has now been paid down. The property is appreciated we've been cash flowing every single month, we can then aim for another refinance to pull the remaining $38,000 out, right? So the sooner we get that $38,000 out, the, the better. Typically we tell um, partners that max three years time, if, if we're doing the calculation uh, better, for something of this small caliber, we might very well be able to pull it out in less than a year really depends on a, a couple different factors. But at the end of the day, to own a brand new three unit property that only have $38,000 in it, it's pretty sweet in my opinion. So this is only halfway done. We've only just run the high level numbers for what a typical property could, uh, how it could function in, in this capacity. But now we've got to think about, okay, well, we got to hold this property for the next you know, 5, 10, 15 years, however long our partners and us want to hold on to this property for. So we have to analyze it from that capacity as well. And this is where, once again, the magic of the return on investment really shows itself. So if, once again, three family unit, we managed to create, uh, create uh, two one beds and one three bed. So our total income on this property from the rent was equal to $4,140 every single month. Our three bedrooms bring in $1,690. Our, one of our one bedrooms is bringing $1,350 and then $1,100 for the basements, which adds up to our $4,140 every single month that's coming in from rent, all right? Now we have operating expenses. Now, if you guys wanna go through what operating uh, expenses are, check out yesterday's video where I outline on a typical buy and hold what some of those expenses are gonna be. Uh, property management, we're talking property taxes themselves, any utilities that we have to pay. Um, <clears throat> is there uh, you know, any sort of rentals for like a, a hot water tank or something like that? These are all factors that play into what the property costs to operate, right? So our total operating expenses on this particular project is $1,111.20. That's what it comes out to on our latest budget. So if we take a look at our net operating income, which effectively is our income 
minus our operating expenses minus a 3% uh, vacancy rate. We always want to add vacancy in there. So vacancy of 3%. If we subtract all of this together, our net operating income is $2,904.60. Now this is before debt servicing. Remember, when you're talking about how a property actually operates and functions, you always do those calculations before debt service. The reason being is that debt service varies between any person out there, but the operation of the actual building itself is typically fixed. So that's how we can ca uh, accurately calculate the value of the building itself is how well it operates, right? So if we look at the actual mortgage on this $572,000 and how much we'd be dishing out every single month, right? We want to make sure we cash flow our mortgage payment at the end of the day came out to $2,448.64. So subtracting our net operating income from what we actually have to service as debt, aka the mortgage, we end up walking away with $455.96 every single month. That's positive cash flow. That's above and beyond servicing the debt. That's above and beyond servicing any of the operating expenses. That goes into our pocket every single month that we share with our partners, right? Pretty cool, eh? Now, I wanna go back to the Burr thought process because if we compare this to what a typical buy and hold would be, that's once again, that ROI, like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, that's where that ROI really shines. So I'm gonna do a little comparative as to what this would be like. So let's say theoretically, we do just a typical buy and hold, right? Versus the burr, versus. The buy and hold, if, if I went and I found this property, it's a three unit property, completely renovated, already done for me. I don't have to do anything. I just gotta walk in there, put down the down payment. A down payment on a $715,000 property like this is going to come out to $143,000, right? Pretty, pretty hefty. Now, if you consider what, what that looks like with closing costs and things like that, you're probably closer to $155,000. So let's run with that for now because you have land transfer tax, you have all those kind of factors that you also have to play into, right? So you buy it, you put $155K down. A lot of people don't have 155k just to slap onto a property but if you look at the buy and hold side we have our cash on cash so if we take our, our monthly mortgage payment here $455,000 and we multiply it every single month for so 12 months our total cash on cash is equal to $541,500 which is equal to if we take this amount and divided by initial investment is 3.52%, right? So if we, if we do that math, it's three, three, three and a half percent, not too shabby for a typical cash on cash return. If we have our mortgage pay down, that is in the amount of 11,705. So once again, we take this amount and we divide it against our initial investment and that comes out to 7.54%. And then we take our appreciation, which we're anticipating at a 4% growth. That is a hefty one at 28,600. And that return on itself is 18.42%. So in total, if we look at this from a simple buy and hold standpoint, that all the work's being done to us, we just have to show up with a big fat check to put 20% down and we get the mortgage for the 572. Our total return on investment for this deal to be 29.48%. Still pretty good, actually, if you ask me. But the Burr model makes this really, really cool. Because remember, how much do we actually have in the deal still? $38,000. So when we're running our amount left in deal, right? It's only 38K. So let's take this $5,451 uh, $5, because the cash flow is going to be the same either which way. doesn't matter. Still the same number. It just amounts to how much of our actual money from our pocket do we still have in the deal. 
That return, if you take the 5451 divided by the $38,000, that's actually a 14.03% return. So your cash on cash return. Your mortgage pay down. Mortgage pay down is going to be the same too. You're still carrying a $572,000 mortgage. Here you're carrying a $572,000 mortgage just being paid off at the same rate theoretically. But the amount that we have left in the deal, once again, is so much less that our return on investment is actually 30.01%, right? Compared to 7.54%. And then lastly, appreciation. We're going to take the same 20,600 on the on the the current value of 715. So at a 4% growth, that $28,000 working on the 38,000 versus the 155,000, that's a 73% ROI. So if you look at the total ROI here, we're actually looking at 117.38 ROI. Now look at the difference. You have 29.48% return on a typical buy and hold, but your BRRRR return on investment is actually 117%. That's four times greater return from doing a BRRRR on the same property that someone might go out and just buy and, and rent out. Right, so that's why I really like the burr because if you have the um, if you have the capacity to do some of the renovations or or coordinate some of the renovations, you can really impact your return on investment. And once again, we're in the business of creating awesome returns for our partners. That's what we do. So when we can showcase a property like this to our partners, and they say, "Holy crap!" At the end of the day, if we collectively make 117 percent, that's that's wild where are they going to have an opportunity to do that in their lives, right? So I hope you guys got this example. Um, if you guys have any questions on some of the numbers, you want to go through in more detail, definitely give us a call. You know, check us out. If you go on, you know, go on our website, you can reach out to us there too. Last thing, typical properties to burn. So when we're talking about what kind of properties are effectively good ones to burn, right now, once again, if we're thinking about a cash flow versus uh, 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 what's it called? A cash flow versus equity type town. If we're going to burrow out a property in Oakville, right? The property you buy a, you know, a, a rundown property there for a million bucks, right? So now you're going to put in money to fix it. You're going to refinance it to a higher level, which is possible. But then you're going to rent it out. And then what happens? You're not going to cash flow. It's not going to really work. So you still have to find the right location to implement the strategy. And that's what's really important. So what we often find, I know that there's this mad craze now of doing duplex conversions. We see a lot of people doing that. We've done them and we still continue to do them because they're great ways to create a return on investment. You can buy a property on the Hamilton Mountain at 400000 put $120,000 into it, and reappraise it closer to $600,000. Now, you're laughing, right? This is where that burr can really work, and this is where it can work in your favor. So... Focus on working from the top down. And I'm not saying necessarily from the ROI standpoint. I'm saying theoretically, what's the best, highest and best use of the property? When you're looking at that structure, say, okay, can can I make viably two units out of it? Can I make three units out of it without causing it to look like a rooming house or some sort of you know crazy contraption that you've slapped together? Right? If you can now then project what your rents could be. Be, could be a little conservative, right? When we ran these numbers originally, we were much less conservative, but it, it made sense though, so we went ahead and we we're pleasantly surprised. That's what you really want. But anticipate what your rents are gonna be based on the configuration of the unit composition that that property can create. That is key, number one. It's at that point you're gonna run your numbers at what you anticipate your future ARV going to be. Once again, be conservative. If all that checks out, then make sure that you run what your construction cost estimate is going to be and see if that's accurate. You know, there's a big difference between $50,000 in a property and $150,000. So make sure that you're being very careful when you're looking into that, okay? So in Hamilton, there's a ton of opportunity. We're still buying. We've actually just closed on one today. Hallelujah. Um, even in this mad craziness. So uh, we'll see. We have three more closing at the end of April, and we'll see how that turns out. But we are very optimistic, and uh, I'm super excited. So once again, thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, any questions at all, feel free to reach, me, uh, reach out to me. My name is Alex Powell, and happy Canadian real estate investing. Cheers.